allowing us to enter into his presence because they are bringing in the presence of the Spirit. And we need the Spirit to touch us. We need the Spirit to guide us, direct us, encourage us, and teach us. And that's what we're doing today. We're learning. We're learning today. And it's like we have a saying, once you know, you can't not know. So once you know, you know. So today, ladies, you know. Now, what's going to make a difference in your lives is what's going to happen when you walk out those doors. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, and that's where we need him to give us strength, to give us discernment, to give us wisdom, to enable us to do the things that we know we need to do. So we've been talking about commitment. Right? Commitment. Are you committed? Committed to, number one, change. Are you willing to change? Because if you're not willing, nothing's going to happen. Right? Second commitment, surrender. Are you willing to give it all to him, lay it all down, not hang on? I love this. I, I use this example a lot. This is how we come to Jesus. If I had more hands, I'd have more stuff. This is how we come to Jesus. And, and look at us. Look what I got. I'm, I'm, I'm loaded down, okay? And, and he can't. I'm so full of me. There's no room for him. I got so much stuff in my arms, he couldn't give me anything else if he wanted to. I couldn't take any more. I'll start dropping stuff. But when I come to him like this, what can he do? How can he use me? I'm open. I'm saying, fill me up. I've laid it all down. I'm not hanging on to that. I'm not hanging on to that part. I don't want that anymore in my life. I'm letting go of this. I'm done with it. We need to start saying, I'm letting go of some things and be done with them. Well, it's hard. Yeah, I know it's hard. I live in this world. I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> I just have to put that out there. I'm 54 years old, in case you're wondering. Thank you, Candace. You're just like the best. I, I want you to come everywhere I go and sit right there and encourage me. She's wonderful. She has a gift of encouragement whether she knows it or not, and that's what she's doing. Thank you for encouraging me today. Okay, so the third commitment, are we ready? Time to get back to business. Fun's over. We're going to have fun. See, this is the wonderful thing about Jesus. We have fun learning. Because today, we're, the third thing we're going to talk about is community. And I'm going to tell you something. This event came about because, not me, a community this is why, this is how we were able to bring this to you today. A community of ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, men. Thank you for coming today. Tyler, Eddie, Bill, Pastor Jose, Keith and Edison. These got Pastor Eddie in the back from Cuba. These men have all helped. Ladies from our ladies group. Thursday night and Friday morning. Community of women and other women who wanted to help, other women who wanted to get involved and be a part of. It takes a community. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a community to walk with Jesus. We don't do well on our own. If you're the Lone Ranger, good luck. Because you're going to need something. Because it ain't going to work. And we're going to talk about community. Are you committed to being surrounded by like-minded friends who support you? Because that's what it takes. We need each other. We have a wonderful testimony of someone. Deanna's going to come up here. She's going to share a testimony of how being connected, being surrounded in a community has made a difference in her life. You're, you know what? This is the cool thing about this place. I might kick off these 
these heels in a little bit. You never know. You can come barefoot, you can come in jeans, in t-shirts, in shorts, because it's not about the outside, it's about the inside, and you have a very beautiful inside and outside. She does, because of Jesus. Hi, I'm Deanna. Uh, it's such a pleasure for me to be a part of this church and this congregation, and to be able to get up here and share my testimony. The first thing I said I was gonna change when she started this is my nervous and anxiety to excitement. I'm excited to be up here. <laughs> because normally the fear of being in front of a crowd of people and sharing something very close, near and dear to my heart would make me just, you know, really nervous. And of course I'm a little bit nervous, but it's just I'm 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 just happy. I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. Um, and my husband, isn't he great? He is great. <sighs> Look, this, this means so much to me. Um, I haven't really had the best relationship with God all my life. Um, I grew up in Baptist church, but my grandma always told me that to be God-fearing, and she didn't explain it to me the right way. So, of course, fearing God was, was what I ended up doing. Um, if it involved God, you know, I was being judged, I was not good enough, I was ugly, I was, you know, just bad. So, growing up like that, I didn't want to have a relationship with God, because I didn't understand it the right way. And it's just been in the last, probably, two years since I joined this church. I moved here from Arkansas and joined this church. And God told me to do that. That's how I got here. Um, and I was obedient and I did that and I have not had one regret. Um, I joined this church and I got involved in the women's group on Thursday night and I got involved in service work and then they ended up wanting to go to uh, Costa Rica on a mission trip and you know, and my mom had just died in November of last year, and and I didn't have the money to go on this trip, so I just said, okay, God, if you want me to go, then I'll go. And what ended up happening is I got a little bit of insurance money back from my mom, just like about seven hundred dollars, and um, I used that money to put toward my trip so I could go to Costa Rica. So you know, I believe that God provided that for me because. My mother really didn't have anything. So he provided that way for me to go because he wanted me, he wanted me to see him at work. He wanted me to, to learn how to believe and to receive. And, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, I saw so many miracles and, and not just in everybody else around me, but in me. I mean, I got to know me. You know, I, I can finally say I'm at a place where I'm not afraid. And I've let God in so deep. I mean, that's the best relationship in my life now. It's, it's the most important thing to me. If I didn't have God, I, I wouldn't have anything. I wouldn't have all these wonderful women in this church. And, you know, if I have anything that I need that I'm struggling with, I come to church. And I give it to God. And I give it to them. And they help me work through it. And I don't have to do anything crazy or stupid. I don't have to get myself in trouble. And I don't have to have any hate and resentment in my heart. I can stay away from that now. Um, th that's just a really cool thing for me because all my life I hung on to things and I was always a victim, you know. It was always, oh, they're hurting me and, you know, why me, why me? I don't, I don't have that, that outlook on, on things anymore. Um, when there's a problem, God is the solution. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm also a recovering addict um, I've been in recovery since January 26th, 2004. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big accomplishment. Um, and, you know, when I first got clean and sober, it was like, I believe in a higher power. And my higher power is God, definitely. I, I'm kind of offended that I called him higher power for so many years. Um, 
but he doesn't hold that against me. I'm forgiven for that because I didn't understand. You know, I had to learn. And I'm telling you, every single Thursday night that I'm in our group, I learn more. I'm learning so much, and I'm learning about the Bible and the people in the Bible and the journeys that they went on, and they're so similar to the journeys that we're on, and it's just such a cool thing that so, this book is so old, and it still applies to everything in our lives. If you're having any kind of a problem, you open up the Bible, and God will tell you how to fix it. It's the neatest thing ever, isn't it? I mean, right? So we came back from Costa Rica, and I told the girls while we were there, I said, mark my words, I'm getting a tattoo when I get home. It's going to say believe and receive. <laughs> and I did. I went and got it. <laughs> and to me, that shows somewhat of a commitment, wouldn't you say? Yes. I mean, if you see it, you can see that this, this is my believe side. These are my antennas. <laughs> These are my antennas to God. And when I'm worshiping him, I always think about the believe side and the receive side, you know? Um, when we pray for people at the cross on Sundays, Pastor Andrew says, stretch out your right hand. That's my receive side. So people can receive the love that I have, Jesus, inside of me. And it gets all over them. And I don't want to get people dirty with that. <laughs> um, it's... Yeah, and I mean, I'm not going to take this body to heaven, but this is, this is a conversation starter. This is something that people can ask me about, and I can share Jesus with them. And how cool is that? But without believing, you can't receive, and that's why the heart is half and half, because you can't do one without the other. It's not ever complete until you deal both. So I know the best thing I can tell you is keep coming back here and filling up on God and trust in him, this world wants to take us down, and it wants to take us out, and it wants us to be miserable, and I refuse, I refuse, because I got God, and God doesn't want me to be miserable. Thanks, you guys, for letting me share my story with you. Moab, because God doesn't do that. 
He doesn't tell you to leave a godly place and go into an ungodly place unless there's maybe a specific reason, but we'll just leave that to another story. Let's just, you know, they did it on their own. God didn't tell them to go. If God tells you to go somewhere, okay. But he didn't tell them to go. That's the point I wanted to make. He didn't tell them to go. They, see, sometimes we do things. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. And it does not work out. And then we start bad the God. Well, for goodness sakes, he didn't tell you to go there. You did it on your own. And sometimes things don't work out when we, i got to show you this. There's this umbrella that God has. It's giant. My umbrella, I have to do my umbrella. Okay? It's, and it's not the little kind you put in your pocketbook. Right? Because those little umbrellas really don't work in a storm. You get very wet. But God's umbrella is the great big patio one. Giant umbrella. And when you're walking with God in his umbrella, under his umbrella, maybe your shoes get wet. Maybe. That's it. You're not going to get really hurt. The storm is just going to kind of bounce off of you. But what happens is we go along with God. And which way can I go that way? We go along with God, and we're just walking along under his umbrella, and everything's good. The storm's just pounding down, and we're just like, okay, okay, I'm safe, I'm dry. I'm, and, and then all of a sudden, we kind of go on these rabbit trails. We see something over here I like. Oh, I think I'm going to start dating this guy who I met at the bar when I was out with my girlfriends. All kinds of things that maybe God would not be with us. So the next thing I know, I'm over here. I'm hanging out with all my friends. I'm kind of going to the bars at night, and I'm getting in trouble, and, and then I find out I'm pregnant. Remember the story last night? Yeah. And then I have an abortion, and all these bad things start happening to me. And, and I start saying, God, where are you? God, why did you leave me out here to get in so much trouble? And the storm just starts pounding, 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 pounding me. Well, where's God? Remember where God is. He's right here. He didn't go anywhere. He's standing right here with his umbrella, waiting for me. And I'm down there getting in so much trouble. So if I would just learn to stick with God, maybe I wouldn't get so beat up in a storm. Amen. Just maybe. And I need some friends to help me sometimes when they see me going off in this place where I shouldn't be going. Joyce, get back here. See, we're accountable to each other. When you see your friend going off somewhere, I'm going to tell you, when the girls doesn't come to ladies' group for a couple weeks, I'm, where are you? What's going on? What happened? What happened? We need each other. Okay, so the mother-in-law is left without her sons. She decides, I better go home. I just, I'm going to go home. This place is no good. And so the two daughter-in-laws at first say they're both going to go with her. And then the mother says, no, you stay with your people. I'll go back to my people. And so one of them just turns around and goes back home. But one of them, in Ruth 1.16, when the mother-in-law Naomi says to her, go back to your people, uh, this is what we need in our life. These are the people that we need in our community. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Don't make me go away from you. Where you go, I go. And where you stay, I stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. See, I need a Ruth in my life. When things are hard, I need Ruth to help me. I need Ruth to stay with me. We need each other. And long story short, because God is just I'm so amazing. They go back to Bethlehem. Ruth, the daughter-in-law, meets a wealthy, handsome, good-looking man who owns a whole bunch of property. They get married. They have a baby. They live happily ever after. And the baby is actually the grandfather of King David. King David. Remember King David? Who is in the lineage of where Jesus, our Lord and Savior, came down from. God used a sinful woman from
from a sinful country who was hanging out with some people who loved God, and she decided she was going to turn her life around and walk with them and use that woman in the lineage of Jesus. Don't ever think God can't use you. Don't ever think you're too bad for God. Don't ever think he doesn't know what's in your heart, and he's going to turn bad to good if you let him. He turns bad to good, but we have to let him. There's another story in Mark, and it's about this guy. He couldn't, he couldn't move. He was an invalid. And Jesus was preaching and teaching and healing. And so these guys' friends said, hey, we're going to take you to Jesus because he'll heal you. So they put him on this mat. Four of them got around him, picked up the corners, and off they go to Jesus because they're going to take their friend to Jesus. And they get there, and the house where Jesus is at is so overflowing with people that no one, they can't get to, they can't get in. Now, you could think, well, okay, they're going to, they can't get into Jesus. They can't get their friend to Jesus. They're going to turn around and go home. We tried. We tried to help you, but we couldn't get to Jesus. No. These guys come up on the roof of the house, and back in those days, the house's tops were kind of flat, and they were made with like a straw thatch. Okay? And so what they do is these guys get up on that house and they start tearing apart the roof. And their plan is to lower their friend. Lower him down right in front of Jesus. They're bound and determined to get their friend in front of Jesus. I'm telling you, I can't even imagine what Jesus was thinking that day. He's sitting in that house. He's teaching. You can just see him like sitting here talking and all of a sudden like this straw starts coming down on his head and he's like, what's going on? And, and, and then it's like dig and then all of a sudden he looks up and there's like four faces looking down at him. And, and then there comes this guy down on the mat. I mean, it's like a movie. They should make a movie of that story. That'd be a cool movie. Wouldn't it? Okay. And so then, uh, this is what happens then. I want to read this. It's in Mark. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 2. And so then, okay, we're going to start at 5, verse 5. Oh, well, let's do verse 4. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, it took a little work digging through it, they lowered the man down on the mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then the people around him were like kind of mad, like, how can you forgive his sins? And he said, hey, would it be easier to heal him or forgive his sins? It'd probably be easier to just say, your sins are forgiven, because anybody could say that. But it was hard to heal. So he first said, your sins are forgiven. And then he said, you're healed. And, he, and then he told the guy, I think he told him to pick up his mat. Let's see. Yeah, that's what Jesus says. Pick up your mat. Get up. This is what he said. Get up, take your mat, and walk. Get up, take your mat, and walk. And the guy picked up his mat, and he was healed. Why was he healed? He was sins were forgiven, and he was healed. Because Jesus has the ability to heal us physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And this guy had his friends to help him. Sometimes we need to bring our friends to Jesus. Maybe we need to bring our friends to church. Maybe we need to bring our friends to a Bible study. Maybe we need to bring our friends to a counseling session. Maybe to a prayer time. We, I don't know. But these guys, the determination of them, the community that they were in, maybe that's what we need to do. We can't 
bring our friends. We can't save our friends. But if we bring them to Jesus, he'll take care of it. See, we don't have to be the savior of the world. All we have to do is just direct them to him. He's the savior. Maybe if they saw something different in you, a little light in you, they might say, I would really like to have what Shirley has. She works out in the world, right, Shirley? She has an, the ability to influence the people that she works around by being a light. So, we want, friends are so vital, we need each other. You know when you have a barbecue grill and you have those charcoals before, like if you don't have a gas grill, when you're out camping or you just have one of those little hibachis and you have those coals that you stack up, right? Okay, and you get those, they have to be all together. And it won't matter how hot they are, if one of those little coals rolls over here, on the end, by itself, you know what happens? It dies out. A lone coal, regardless of how hot it is, will die out if it's left by itself. We need each other. Hebrews 10.24 says this, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I have my own type of God. I have my own spiritual time with God. We go to the beach. That's awesome. I go to the beach too. I also come to church and I also come to Bible study because we need each other. We don't give up. We need each other. I'm just going to tell you this story about this day. This was a Friday. This is Melissa's story. Melissa was renewing her vows with her husband. And so she asked me to stand up for her because we're friends. We're in community together. And I said, I'd love to. So on a Friday afternoon, we go off to our friend Felicia's hair salon to get our hair done. Awesome. Cool. Cool. It's not, the, not a typical Friday. I don't leave here on Fridays and go get my hair done and have really nice dress and I, it was really, you know, just like fun. It was a fun afternoon. She's going to have a wedding. That's fun. We're going to go out afterwards. Our families are going to be together. It's, it's a good, that's a good time. Weddings are awesome, right? Renewals are awesome. So we're in this hair salon. And uh, Melissa's getting her hair done. I'm sitting there reading the magazine, waiting, and this man stumbles in. We see a lot of people stumbling around here at the church. I'm going to confess that. So it, I really was not alarmed. I see it. I'm sorry, but I do see it a lot. But this man just was not doing well, and somebody said, he's, he's not doing very well, so I, I was the only one available to go get some water for him and get a wet towel. And so I'm trying to kind of help this man. And my first thought is maybe he's had too much to drink because that happens. And, but I'm, as I kind of go over to him, God says to me, you, you need to pray for him. I'm like, mm, okay, God, I'll pray for him. I can do that. So I start praying for this man and I'm wiping him and I'm helping him. And he's having a really hard time breathing. And so they have called 911, and we're just kind of waiting for them to come and, and rescue this man. And he's, I think he's going to fall over because he just keeps, like, falling off his chair. And there's marble tile, and I think, oh, this poor man is going to fall down, and he's going to hurt his face on the tile. So I kind of get him down on the ground, on the floor, and I'm just kind of helping him, and I'm kind of sitting behind him, and all of a sudden he kind of rears back, and he falls right into my lap. And I'm like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I don't know this man, and he's not breathing, and he's right in my lap, and I'm just like, oh, God just puts me in the most unusual situation sometimes. So I'm just praying and praying and praying, and I'm not done praying. 
And I'm like, where is the ambulance? It's not, what, what are they supposed to be here, like two minutes or something? What's going on? And so then Felicia and, and Melissa, are, they're, they're not doing hair anymore, and they're over here doing stuff, and everyone's like concerned, and Melissa's calling them back, and we're getting really concerned, and then this man just takes this deep kind of rattly breath, and he just falls back on me. And I say, uh-oh, this is awful. He died. No, he did die. And he didn't come back. This isn't a good ending. This is a bad ending. He died right in my arms on a Friday afternoon when I'm trying to get ready for Melissa's wedding. It was supposed to be a fun day, and it was not a fun day. It was horrible. It was horrible. And, you know, that just bothered me. God, why in the world, why did that have to happen? That just ruined our day. Poor man died. His family, and, you know, I just, all day, I, we came back and we had the wedding. It was beautiful, Melissa. It was a wonderful wedding. But we really weren't the same. Because all we could think about this poor man. I called Bobby and I just start crying. I'm like, he died. Bobby's like, who died? What happened? <laughs> who died, Joyce? And I couldn't talk. And so I said to God, what was that all about? That's why I say to God sometimes, what's up with that? Why did you do that, God? I didn't want to be a man dying in my arms. I'm real happy in Costa Rica when I pray for a man and he lives. But I don't want to pray for a man and he dies. What's up? And you know what God said? I brought him to you because you would pray for him, Joyce. He needed to hear prayers before he died. And we found out that he had had some health problems. We found out who he was. He had been a spiritual man, but he had been very sick. And he needed the name of Jesus in his head. He needed to hear the name of Jesus. And I don't know if he spoke it because I didn't hear him, but God knows. He brought him to this place. He walked past like two doors to walk into the hair salon. Weird. I'm in a hair salon. And that's what God uses us. When we went to his funeral, Melissa and I, his family called us angels because we cared for their father, their husband. We were connected for that period of time. And God used us to bless the man. He used us to bless his family. And sometimes things don't really turn out the way we want but we still need each other all the more. They needed to see that at least their father didn't die on a corner with people walking over him. I said, he died in my arms, and I was praying for him. Who do you surround yourself with? Do they lift you up? Do they tear you down? Are you connected? Are you connected to somebody? You need to be. God wants you to be connected. Your commitment to a community that strengthens you spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Your commitment to a community that lifts you up. You can be like Deanna. Her life has changed because she's connected. There's a whole bunch of women. My life has changed because I was connected. I gave my life to Jesus from a life group, from being connected to a group of women. We need each other. Don't try to be the Lone Ranger. It doesn't work. The fourth C, Christ. He's the last, but he's the first. He's the most important. If you're not connected to Jesus, it's all for nothing. All for nothing. I want to talk about the Apostle Paul. 
the Apostle Paul was connected to Jesus. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He is such an encouragement. And a lot of this book that he wrote was while he was in prison, in chains for Jesus. His life was not going very well. But he was so committed to Jesus that they tried and tried and tried to kill him. And they couldn't because God had him. God had him in his hand. and he didn't, But he didn't start out that way. When Jesus was walking on the earth and right therefore shortly thereafter and his followers were following Jesus, Paul was actually crucifying, stoning Christians, condemning people who followed Jesus. And then God got a hold of him one day. He had an encounter with Almighty God. And his eyes were opened and everything changed. And I'm going to tell you something. When you have an experience, an encounter with the God of the universe, you better open your eyes. And, and, and I hope, I really hope and pray that something changes inside of you. And it changed in Paul. And man, he just became so devoted to Jesus. He, listen to this prayer that he wrote for us. It's in Philippians. I love this. This is for all believers. This is, this is a man who used to crucify Christians. And this is what he's saying to you. Philippians 1, 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and and depth of insight. Why? So that you may, may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He prayed for us that, that our love would grow so deep, our love for God and our love for each other, that we would be pure, blameless, righteous. He cares about us. He cares about you. That was his prayer, that your love for God is so deep, nothing, no thing can get in the way of it. No thing. And, and it wasn't easy for him. I'm just going to tell you a couple things that happened to him. He had 39 lashes beaten for Jesus. Anybody here ever been beaten for Jesus? 39 lashes? Okay. It's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? But willing to do what it takes. He was stoned, hit with rocks. He was shipwrecked three times. He was bitten by snakes. People wanted to kill him. He was cold. He was hungry. He gave his life to Jesus. And as I said, most of the books that he wrote, he wrote from prison. Yet, this is what he says to us. 2 Timothy 4, 5 through 8. Keep your head in all situations. Keep your head. Think clearly. You have a mind? Use it. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. What's an evangelist do? Tell the good news. Discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. He's been doing this, 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 and this is what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. All this happened, he didn't give up. Never, ever, ever give up. He didn't give up. He fought the race. He fought the fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. 
If we keep the faith, what will happen? Same thing for us as for Paul. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. When you see Jesus, what's he going to say? Because you're going to see him. Every one of us is going to see him. What's he going to say to you? Did you fight the good fight? Or did you say, you know, whatever? What's he going to say to you? Did you get the crown? Or did you get the shake? Whatever doesn't cut it. I'm serious. This is serious. All who have longed for his appearing. All who have fought the race. Fought the fight. Run the race. Everybody gets the crown of righteousness. It's not just for Paul. It's not just for Candace. And I know Miss Shirley's got about five of them. Not just for them. For every one of us. If you don't give up. Don't give up. Stay committed to Jesus. It's easy. Again, while we're here, it's easy. But what's it going to be like when you go home? Because I want to promise you, there's always some, something. There's always something. My mom used to say that. There's always something. I'm telling you, that's the truth. There's always something. But there's always Jesus. So what do you want, the something or you want Jesus? It's your choice. It's your choice. I want to fight the good fight. I want to. It's not, I'm going to, but I'm going to, because I want to. I have the desire. There's a guy named Peter who was committed to Jesus, but some days he wasn't. Some days he was, but some days he wasn't. Anybody like that here? Some days you're like, I got you, Jesus. I got your back. I'm there for you, dude. I don't know if we should call Jesus, dude. Sorry. But you know what I'm saying. And then some days, Peter said, I don't know that guy. I haven't been around him. I know nothing about him. Because he was afraid. He was a little bit scared when things got hard. He wanted to run away from Jesus. But you know what? Jesus knew Peter's heart. And he knew Peter would be a powerful man for his kingdom. And Jesus didn't give up on Peter. And Peter didn't give up on Jesus. Because uh, Peter knew who Jesus was. Matthew 16 says, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's asking, you know, who's everybody saying I am? Who am I? And Peter says this to Jesus. Some say you're, some, some of the disciples said, some say you're John the Baptist. This is verse 14, Keith, 16, 14. Some say you're Elijah, and still others say you're, you're Jeremiah or a prophet. But Jesus said, well, who do you say I am? Who do you, I don't care what they say. Who do you say I am? Who am I to you? Because it doesn't matter what others say about Jesus. Who is he to you? Are you committed to him? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter knew who he was. And Jesus said, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you but by man, but by God. When God shows himself to you, you know that you know that you know. And ended up, when the Holy Spirit came, when the Holy Spirit filled Peter, see, on his own, he had no power. He was back and forth, back and forth. Some of us are back and forth, back and forth. I'm in church, I'm out of church. I'm in church, I'm out of church. You know why you're back and forth? Because you don't have any power, because you've not allowed the Holy Spirit to bring power into your life. 
Because Acts 1 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then, when you've got the power of the Spirit, then you'll be my witness. You aren't going to be back and forth when you get the power of the Spirit inside of you. And then when you're his witness, you're going to be a witness in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. See, when you get the power, then you can make a difference all over the place. In your little Naples town, in the area, you might even go to Mockley and make a difference. You're going to make a difference. Because when Peter received the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he preached a message and 3,000 people came to know Jesus. Now, could somebody clap? 3,000 people. That's a good day. That's a good day for any preacher. Pastor Andrew would be very excited if 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus one day. Amen. That's a good day. That's what happens when you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be in and out and in and out. Some of you are like Peter, and you're just not. You just can't. Make a commitment to Jesus today. Why not today? Why not today? And let Jesus, let Jesus. Do you see how these commitments can change your life? Over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. There was a woman at a well that Jesus showed himself to. She was the first person that he actually professed to being the Christ. And she wasn't really a very spiritual woman. She wasn't really a very godly woman. I can really relate to the woman at the well. She had five husbands. I didn't have five husbands, but I might as well have had a whole bunch of men. So what's the difference? She had five husbands, and the one she li was living with wasn't her husband then. And she met Jesus, and everything changed. When you meet Jesus, everything changes. And she turned from ungodly to godly. And she went back to her town, and because of her testimony... The whole town met Jesus. Many, many, many were saved. How many people do you think you might be able to bring to Jesus if he really changed you and you really were different? I don't mean like everybody else. If you're like everybody else, there's nothing different about you. I mean like Jesus. If you were like Jesus, how many people might you bring to Jesus. And if you could be committed to change, to surrender, to community, and to Christ, you might become more and more like Jesus every day. It takes a little effort, though. I told you I was been married 18 years. It's taken a lot of effort to be married 18 years. And my husband's good. I'm not. I'm not good. He's good. I'm not. It takes effort to be in relationship with people. Sometimes I'm tired and someone walks in. Do you have a minute? Yes, I have a minute. I have a minute. And it turns into four hours. I have a minute. It gets crazy. Life gets real crazy. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So, let's just say a couple things, and we're getting ready to close out. 
The first step to healing is understanding you have a problem, right? Or realizing maybe the way I've been thinking hasn't, isn't quite right. Maybe I gotta change the way I think so I change the way I act. Or maybe, this is how I've always discovered this, I know something's not right. I'm not really sure what it is, but I know something's not right in my life. And I have to examine. It hurts to examine sometimes. It's easier to just say I'm fine, everything's okay, whatever. That's easy. Commitment's hard. I'm not talking easy stuff here. Commitment's difficult. But man, is it worth it. Don't you want the crown of righteousness? Don't you want Jesus to say, man, Joyce, you did good. And I'm going to say, but I, it was hard. It was very difficult. And he said, I know. He tells me all the time. It's difficult to live for him. But there's nothing else I want to do. There's nothing else that's worth anything. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's difficult not living for Jesus. In case you haven't figured that out. It's very difficult not living for Jesus. It's very difficult living, period. Jesus is much better. Reflection time, what's in here? What, what's bumping? What are you thinking? What's going on? Can you say, wow, I feel like that. I can't believe, that's how I used to think. I can't believe anybody else feels like this. And then I started telling people some of my story and they felt like this and I'm like, wow, everybody, we all have stuff. We, Christians aren't perfect. They're just willing to say, I'm a messed up person that needs Jesus. That's all. That's all. So you have a couple choices. You can allow him to say, you know what, today, God, I just want you to change my life. You can do that. And, and we're going to work through some stuff, and we're going to, I'm going to allow this weekend to really make a difference. Or you can go back out. You can do the same thing you've been doing, and, and, and when you're laying battered and banged up and down in the bottom of the pit, and the only way out is help. He'll help you then too. I'm usually that one. I'm usually that one. I'm not. I'm serious. But I'm trying to learn not to be that one. I'm trying to learn to say, Jesus, I'm willing right now before it gets before I get that bad to allow you to work through me and make some changes. And it, 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 it takes some time. We have to spend time with him in prayer. We have to spend time in the word. We've got to be a community of people. We need to be around each other. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I want to seek God with my whole heart. And I promise you, when you do, he's there. Oh, it's like, man, thank you. Thank you. And if you, if you can follow these commitments, if you can follow these commitments, things will start changing. You're going to be different. You're going to be more like Jesus. You're going to have a different belief system. And what do we say? If you don't get anything this weekend, my actions follow my beliefs. If my beliefs are faulty, my actions are faulty. Can you, under, can you say that? My actions follow my beliefs. If my beliefs are faulty, my actions are faulty. I want the right belief system. I would like to just go forward without all the... You know, the Israelites took a 40-year trip that should have taken 11 days. That's a messed up belief system and some actions that were taking them all over the place. What do you want to do? You want to be like them? What did we say too? See, I'm trying to, are you, are you learning? Once you know, you can't not know. Once you know, then we got to do something. We have to do something. Just don't ever give up. That guy, Winston Churchill, he was this English prime minister, and he said, don't ever, ever, ever give up. You can't lose if you don't give up. But when you give up, boom, it's over. It's done.
Just don't give up. Sometimes you gotta sit down. Sometimes you just gotta plop yourself down for a little bit. That's okay, because guess what? When I'm sitting down, I'm not going backwards. I'm not going backwards. See, Jesus is this way. Well, actually, last night, he was this way. So I better stay the same way. Jesus is this way. And as long as I'm going forward, might go a little faster, might go a little slower, might fall down, might sit down. It's okay. Just don't do this. Because where's Jesus? He's behind me. And when Jesus is behind me, I cannot see him. I cannot hear him. I cannot be guided by him. Don't, don't, don't go backwards. Don't turn around. If you've got to sit down, sit down. I told you about last night when I lost that little baby, when he was born, stillborn. I sat down. I sat down. But I didn't go backwards. I just sit down for a while because I hurt. It's okay. We've got to sit down sometimes. Life just is always just boom, boom, boom. I need a break. I need a little break here. I'm going to sit down. But Jesus isn't going to leave me. I'm going to sit down so I don't go backwards, so I don't fall down and go do something stupid. I'm telling you, I've been times I've had hung on for dear life. God, don't let go of me. Please just don't let go of me because I, I will do something horrible if you let go of me. I have a history of drug and alcohol abuse. I'll go backwards if he lets go of me. I don't want that. I don't want to do that anymore. That's the old me. I'm not that gutter girl. I'm Jesus' child, and so are you. Don't go back, and don't give up. Don't give up. I want you to close your eyes, and we're going to talk to God, because he's our answer. I don't have your answers. I wish I could just say, this is it. Everybody just do what I told you, and it's all good. And kind of that is true. But you have to be willing. And there's something inside of you that's been touching you. And maybe you're like that woman at the well that you think, I'm like, I'm like too bad for Jesus. <laughs> he can't love me because I did so many bad things. But he loved her so much. He said, he told her who he was. He, he, he she had an encounter with him. Maybe you're like Peter. And, and, and some days you're in, and some days you're out, some days you're in, and some days you're out. Why don't you just get in? Why don't you just get in? Peter was also the one that jumped in the water, though. And he walked on water because he jumped in the water. It's okay to be like Peter in the end part because he preached a message and 3,000 were saved when the Holy Spirit touched him. Let the Holy Spirit touch you today. Maybe you're like Paul, and you never believed in this Jesus thing, and you just made fun of people who walk with Jesus. But now God's saying, you know what? The Holy Spirit's knocking on your door and saying, hey, I'm real. This Jesus thing is real. It's real. I'm real. Thank you for being so real, God. Thank you that you're real. Maybe you're like that guy on the mat. You need some friends. You need some friends to help you. Maybe you need some friends to help you. Maybe you have a friend that needs you to help. Maybe that's it. Maybe you're like Ruth. You grew up in a pretty bad place. You did some bad things, but you're different now. You're not the same. You, you, you've met people who know Jesus. You're walking with Jesus. And God's going to use you to change the world if you let him. Only if you're willing. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing? Please be willing. Maybe you've had such horrible things like Abraham's father. Such pain in this in-between place that you cannot get out of it. You can't move forward. You, you just are stuck. And you're settling. You're settling for a life that's less than. Don't settle. Jesus died so that you could have life 
to the full in abundance because the enemy wants you to settle. Don't settle. Maybe you're like the woman with the issue of blood. You've been rejected over and over and over again, and it hurts so bad you don't want to step out. You don't want to take another step. You don't want to try one more time. You don't want to reach out one more time. But Jesus says, this time when you reach out, I'm here. I'm here. If you reach out one more time for me, I am here. And what they did to you, I will not do to you. When they rejected you, I will not reject you. I will love you. I will love you with an unconditional love that you've never had before. Maybe you're like little Gideon. <laughs> and you're a little bit insecure or a whole lot insecure. And you're afraid. And you say, you know, God, I don't think that's really you. God, I, I can't do this. I'm not big enough. I'm just, I'm, I can't, I can't, I can't. Guess what? With God, you can. All things are possible with God. Nothing is impossible for God. Maybe you're like that guy at the pool, that invalid for 38 years. And you're just really not quite willing to say, it's up to me. You just, you're the victim. Maybe it's an excuse. Maybe there's you waiting for something. You're waiting for someone else. Well, when he does this, I'll do this. When he apologizes to me, I'm going to forgive him. When he tells me he's sorry for doing that, then I will let this go. No, no, no. It's not about them. It's all about you. It's not about them. You are only responsible for you. Give them to God. You take responsibility today. You receive forgiveness. You forgive. And you receive healing. That's what it's about today. Maybe you were like me. I'm just a regular person who was all messed up. I was all messed up. And some days I wonder if I'm not still. But Jesus loves me. And he changed my life. And I'm receiving his love. And I believe it. And today I want you to believe it. And I want you to receive it. And I want it so much for you. But I can't do it for you. I want everybody here to receive his healing touch. But I can't force it. I can only ask you to let him in. This is the time that we're going to have right now. To let him in. To let him touch. The praise team is going to worship. We have a prayer team here that's going to pray for you. I want everybody to stand up. I want you to think about your hearts. I want you to come forward. I want you to let us pray for you. I want you to come forward. If you don't want prayer, I want you to just stand up here and say, God, I'm yours. If it's in your heart. If it's in your heart. I want you to connect to God. To his spirit. Because when the power comes in you, you won't be the same. When his power comes upon you, you won't be the same. And then you're going to be a witness. And that's what we need to be a witness for Jesus. Because there's a lost and dying world out there. I told you that last night. Jesus doesn't care about us when we're saved. We're in. We're in the sheep pen. It's the lost ones that need help. That's our job. But you know what? I can't save someone when I'm drowning. I can't save a soul when I'm fighting for my life and that's water. Get yourself out of the water. Get up on the dry land and look around and see who needs help. That's what Jesus wants for you today. Father, thank you for your touch. Lord, touch hearts. Let your spirit touch. Let your spirit anoint. Let your spirit heal today in the name of Jesus. This is for you. I'm going to ask you not to leave. I'm going to ask you to stay. I'm going to ask you to stay. Please don't leave. I'm going to ask you to stay. And let the Spirit touch you and heal you today in Jesus' name.